Good morning, everybody. And thank you for the kind. Oh, wow. <laughs> and thank you for the kind invitation to uh, to speak again. What I'm going to do is to maybe outline some of the the challenges, but what I also believe is some of the massive opportunities because this industry is a hundred years old. And by the way, many car companies that started in the UK were there at the start. But we've roughly done what we've done in the same way for 100 years. Cars have got better, no doubt. But we actually designed them in a similar way. We manufactured them in a similar way. And our customers ultimately uh, had the use of them in a similar way. And in the next five to seven years, we're probably going to change all of it. And that means we are at the tipping point of the most exciting period in this great industry. An industry which, just to put the numbers on it, is worth $2 trillion a year. And if you add up the mobility part on top of it, it's worth $10 trillion a year. So the stakes are high, but the chances are also very great. Now, we celebrated our 100th year last year, and we showed some vision cars. This was a BMW, I think you all agree. It looks like a BMW, very different maybe. This was a Mini, and we unveiled that car here in London uh, in May of last year. This was a Rolls-Royce, a grand vehicle by anyone's uh, imagination, so large that we had to have the press conference in front of it because the room was not quite big enough. And finally, in Los Angeles at the end of the year, we showed a motorcycle. Now, all of these had a couple of things in common. They were all connected. They were all capable of autonomous driving, or in this instance, riding. And of course, they were all zero emissions. So the themes were constant. And these are the themes which are driving the industry. These are the themes which will bring the change and the opportunity that we are embarking upon. And when we asked our customers, and we've done a very extensive survey, what do they think they're going to use their vehicle for in the future? You know, in a nutshell, they believe they're going to do a lot more things in their vehicle. It's not as it was in the past. It's not just for transportation. So we know our customers' lives are busier. We know all our lives are busier. And therefore, one of the things we search for is this most valuable asset called time and how we can utilize our time, particularly in an urban, particularly in a traffic environment, better. So the industry is definitely at a crossroads. And there are, of course, big groups of tech companies in California, or in Silicon Valley, or many of them in Shanghai and Beijing, and some here in Europe. And of course, the usual suspects, the companies that, you know, I look at our performance versus their performance every month, and we know all they are. We know a lot about our usual suspect competitors. But these other companies are coming in and saying, I want a part of that $10 trillion industry. $10 trillion industry. That's why they are circling. That's why they see the chances. That's why they see the opportunities. And that's why, in many respects, they see disruption as the answer to where they're going. We've coined the phrase ACES. I like saying it because it's easy to remember. It's autonomous. It's connected. It's electrified. And in some instances, it is shared. Now, when I was here a couple of years ago, I talked more in detail about some of those. But today, of course, we want to really look at autonomous. So those, what, well, that was what we used to do. We used to travel from home to work. This is the 5% utilization of a very expensive asset that we all generally use, or should I say, don't use. Don't use, 5%, not too long. It sits in the middle of our life. And what we want to do is to bring those things together. 
And how do we do that? It is very much about ACES. Our customers, they don't want to be connected. They need to be connected. It's gone from want, it's gone from desire, it's gone from wouldn't it be nice to need. I bet everyone in this room has got a smartphone in their pocket. Everyone. And I bet they're still on because we need to be connected. People are going to clinics because they need to switch them off sometimes. <laughs> Isn't that a thought? But generally, we need to be connected. Everybody knows this triangle, I'm sure. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Of course, it starts with breathing and eating and drinking. Some of us need more of that than others. And it ends at the top with how we make a difference, self-actualization. But if I ask the kids what's missing, <laughs> oops, and they say Wi-Fi and battery. And by the way, probably before I eat. Yeah, eating, that can wait. But I need my Wi-Fi. And in order to enable me to enjoy my Wi-Fi, I need a battery. Because this connected world is what we're now taking for granted. And it's only 10 years since the first iPhone came to market. And of course, we're now on iPhone 6 and iPhone 7. So the change is rapidly coming. And so why should the automotive industry not be at the leading edge of this change? Because we have driven industrial policy, industrial activity for the last century. So it's grabbing hold of what that means. I know from BMW customer surveys that they are in this world. There are very few of them, less than 10%, who say, I actually don't need it in my car. Most of them want to have it in their car all the time. We know that around the world, and this is one of the questions that was just referred to a minute ago, there are some differences as to people's behavior and expectations as to data. In the United States, people are really relaxed about it. They're not having the debates that we're having in Europe, where it's much more conservative. Now, why is Silicon Valley so strong? Because this data is seen as yeah, the next interesting thing. In Europe, we're thinking a little bit different about it. And we want to put some restrictions around it. We're very conscious about data privacy. But we still want to have the use of it. In China, they're really enthusiastic. It always encourages me when I talk to Chinese customers and I say, this is what our car is now going to do. And they go, is that all? Can't it do more? Isn't there another thing we can do? They're really enthusiastic. And of course, across the bottom, automotive customers are digitally minded. And premium customers are very digitally minded. Youngsters, younger people, are much more receptive. The urbanites are very much embracing this. And there is no gender differences. It applies to all genders in the same and equal measure. So we launched a big app called the Connected App. That was quite creative, wasn't it? Calling it the Connected App. And what it does is it tries to start to join up your life. So it will wake you up in the morning if it works out that the journey that's in your business calendar and the time you need to leave, you're still asleep. That's not for everybody, but it shows how we're trying to find the way to make it more usable. And I will be the first to admit we're at the very early stages of this. We have eight and a half million cars on the road connected, probably more than many companies, if not, in some instances, most. And you see the app here growing very, very rapidly in the countries that it's offering. But it's early days. Because the connectivity ideas, and we have 300 app developers in an office in Chicago, 
outside of the mainstream BMW, who all they do all day is reiterate this app. And I meant to say that deliberately because we literally, and in some instances it is, daily issue an update. Because this world of apps is not a seven-year cycle like the car industry. This is a daily cycle. And what we learn today, we change tomorrow. And what we have as the structure today and the features today, we can change tomorrow. And those engineers, all they're doing is this. So we're continually updating it. Because we know when it says app update, we think of this quite positively. I'm getting something. Actually, a lot of it is app correction. Think about it a bit differently. And that's what happens. So we have a ton of apps now available to sit on the car platform, whether it be music, whether it be business, all of it is capable of sitting within the platform. We're launching cars and features, and in this case, autonomous pilot, in shows like CES. It's not just car shows anymore, because the industry has changed. And really, you're starting to see features like Cortano, where you can talk to it and say anything you want, and you know how it works, you have it in your home, many of you, it will now activate in your car. And your car will be able to be opened for a parcel to be put in it. Amazon Prime. Very simple. Much more convenient. Better than the parcel that sits on your woodshed. Or worse still, out in the cold, or even worse still, disappears. Someone can open your car and they can put it in. All of these things are happening. And what the car, of course, will look like in the future is the greatest excitement for the design teams they've had in decades. Because what used to be the interior of a car will change. Do we know all the answers? No. I sat in a simulator just before Christmas. It was a two-hour session, and after a quarter of an hour, I had to get out of it. I wasn't feeling too well. Because as you start to do things, rather than concentrate on the roads, other things happen to you. It's not very helpful to say to your children who say, I'm feeling unwell, read a book, you'll feel better. It doesn't generally help. And these things are now in our thinking. Of course, autonomous is on this step-by-step -step journey. It does, and the minister mentioned some of this, have some themes to it. The technology is the exciting bit for the engineers. Engineers love to have the next big thing to solve. And the connectivity and the digitalization is enabling it. The customer will get more time, more comfort, more security. And society, there was a lot of talk in the minister's uh, situation about safety. Absolutely, fully behind what he said, cars will become much safer. And that safety, of course, is a very big driver. But I thought I'd show you this video. Let's see if it clicks into video. It's got another four or five seconds to run. Because, ladies and gentlemen, that's what we're trying to achieve. Mother Nature cracked these things a long time ago. The technology hasn't allowed us humans to have the ability to do what that flock of starlings done, has done. And we've all seen that. This swarming capability, this swarming skill set, is what we're trying to achieve in autonomous driving. And the birds, there weren't any falling out of the sky. There weren't any running into collisions because a very well-known scientist called Craig Reynolds came up with a theory. It's about separation, it's about alignment, and it's about cohesion. And there was probably a million birds there moving fast in random directions, and not one of them flew into their partner. 
Now, how the hell do they do it? They've got no smartphones in their pockets, but they do it. And this is where we see nature having capabilities that we need to understand. And that's the excitement of where we're going. Because all of those things of separation and cohesion are what is now driving the tech into the car to deliver the capability to avoid the accidents. And avoiding the accidents is, of course, fundamental to the enjoyment of having more time to do what we need to do in the car. So here's a nice aircraft, the A350. The latest thing, 6,000 sensors on board, generating 2.5 terabits a day. Up there, there's actually not a lot going on. Yeah, sorry, you know, there's not many planes that are flying in the opposite direction. And if they are, they're well controlled. It's quite a simple environment. By the way, there are three pilots always. And it's been autonomous for a few decades now. But they're there. Our cars, at this stage, are currently delivering four terabytes of data per day per car. Now, you have a speaker from Intel later. Can you see what the excitement of the computer industry is? Because the amount of generated data here is enormous, and it is going to grow. So the aviation industry is, this is child's play compared to what's going to happen in the car industry. Child's play. So we have concepts running all around the world now, programs running in cities around the world. In the second half of this year, we will have 47 series running in various cities, utilizing full autonomy. But I stress with someone who is sat there in case they need to interfere. Because this whole tech area, along with new partners, along with new players, and we've brought together, in our view, one of the strongest groups. We brought together Intel, we brought Mobileye. Intel have now decided to buy Mobileye. That tells me that the partnership is a good one. We now have Baidu and Tencent investing in our here mapping company because our mapping company needs to move from digitalized maps of six to 10 meter accuracy, great to go to Birmingham this morning, to six to 10 centimeters or even less for autonomous. Those things are now well underway. Because this is a journey. Now we love the word journey because that's what drives our industry. And these stages, right the way through from the driver to the passenger, 
is going to take time. And companies have said they've cracked it. And by the way, they've all rode back recently saying, ah, maybe we were a little too positive because the technology is still at its infancy. But I think the technology will, robust, will be robust enough in a period of five years. But I also think the legislation, the government involvement, is going to take a longer period. And I think it will be sporadic. I don't think it will be uniform. I think it will be different for autobahns and downtown city centers. I think it will be different in one country to another country. And of course, all of these factors are really now just beginning to be thought about. You heard the minister say so, that governments are now interested in the opportunity and how they drive the business forward. Because at the end of the day, this is what's happening to the auto industry. We are moving in the direction of being tech companies. And that tech company journey is the most exciting phase, as I mentioned right at the start, for the last hundred years. I also, and I would say this, wouldn't I, I think it's much more difficult for a tech company to become an auto company. Going the other way, I think we can make enormous strides. But don't, and I'm sure no one in this room, underestimates the capability of one of the world's greatest industries, which is automotive. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I would be delighted to take any questions.